On the regenerative journey, our goal is to nurture and facilitate the lives and journeys of all our followers, which is why we've teamed up with Resource Consulting Service, RCS, Australia's leading provider of education and advisory services in regenerative agriculture. RCS trains and consults across the ag sector from individuals and families through to corporates and even government, empowering people to grow productive and profitable businesses in diverse and, importantly, healthy landscapes. They understand that the future of healthy families, resilient communities and regenerative farming lies in holistic education. Over the last 15 years, they've played an integral role in my own regenerative journey. And I have a lot to thank RCS for, and I'm one of 7,500 others who have attended their farming and grazing for profit course. I don't know where I'd actually be, uh, and I certainly wouldn't be this far down my own regenerative journey if I hadn't completed a significant amount of training with the RCS team. I can't recommend more highly uh, RCS to anyone looking to start their regenerative journey in a supportive and proven environment. Terry, McCosca, and your team, you absolutely rock. And we're also absolutely stoked to be collaborating with them now. For my listeners only, we're offering a 10% discount on all farming and grazing for profit schools and grazing clinics in Australia this year. If you add this to the early bird rate of a seven-day school, you could get a whopping $1,000 off the standard price. Simply add the code CHARLIERCS, that's CHARLIERCS, that's one word, at the checkout to get your concession. How awesome is that? Now head to the show notes to find out more. We were firm in what we believed, what we were doing, and uh, we we became, you know, you get a bit thick-skinned after a while and you don't really care what anyone thinks what you're doing. You do what you believe is right and for the good of your, of your work, for good of what you're producing and, and for your own health as well. That was John and Kim Kaleski, and you're listening to The Regenerative Journey. From wherever we are, we acknowledge the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia, recognising their continuing connection to this land, its waterways, the stars in the skies since time immemorial. We pay our respects to the elders, knowledge holders and to all the generations of First Nations peoples who have nurtured their unceded sovereign lands for over 80,000 years and continue to do so today. G'day, I'm your host Charlie Arnott, an 8th generational Australian regenerative farmer and in this podcast series I'll be diving deep and exploring my guests' unique perspectives on the world so you can apply their experience and knowledge to cultivate your own transition to a more regenerative way of life. Welcome to The Regenerative Journey with your host Charlie Arnott. G'day and welcome back to The Regenerative Journey. Um, before I jump into introducing John and Kim Kaleski, our guests for this episode, I just wanted to say I'm experimenting uh, at the moment, <clears throat> videoing this little Roma, our little intro for, for the episode to pop on social media. <clears throat> Excuse me, I probably could have had a glass of water before I started. Um, so for those who might have been listening to this, inter- this interview now because of Instagram, because i recording the little intro bit, um, I'm going to pop it up there and see how that goes. I've seen others do the same thing. Um, it's going to look a bit odd because I've got this m- big microphone in my lap <clears throat> where it generally isn't usually sitting, but I'm going to have to push on nonetheless. Excuse me. <coughs> oh, yeah. Okay. Just uh, – oh, it's gone red there, Reese. I'm too close to the action. Um So I'm just going to start with something that was really interesting. I saw that Dr – um, Pran Yoganathan, a wonderful doctor in, based in Sydney, who is doing some amazing stuff um, in the medical world. So he's a trained doctor. He's all about uh, many, many things, holistic wellness, um, uh, gut health, you know, the, 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 the connection between you know, mind, mind, body, spirit and gut especially and <clears throat> all those wonderful things, stuff that I think that um, – most doctors aren't trained in, unfortunately, uh, and he. Oh, I'm going to interview. I'm going to interview um, Pran at some point because I'm really keen to understand where his kind of um, where his interest in all that and, and in that field. Because it, I mean, it should be. This is the interesting thing, and why I'm making the point. My view is it actually should be something that is um, standard fare for doctors. You know, this is this is you know called an old style kind of way to. Um, to, to be to be a doctor to doctor uh, and that it's a much more natural way to do it I mean I, I, I'm I, 
I'm, you know, there are interventions that need to take place, obviously medical interventions, um, and thank God for the modern medicine in terms of that, you know, the surgery and the way they can save lives and, <clears throat> you know, um, have babies, you know, people who, who, you know, who may not be able to have babies can have babies as examples. Also, there's a whole field of general health and, and wellness that I think that's just totally been missed. So my point being that Pran, doctor, the good doctor, posted something really interesting the other day. Um, it's something I've been thinking about and, and I was interested in it back in, say, 12 months ago at least in the middle of the spicy flu, um, that the if you were to turn on uh, mainstream media, and I, I, I've got to say I didn't do that ter- terribly much, if you were to... Um, and you looked at and listened to the health ministers, health advisors, not just in Australia but from around the world, if anyone did that, you might remember that you were probably looking at some of the most unhealthy people that you could imagine looking at and listening to and supposedly taking advice from. We had obese, um, uh, uh, very sallow-looking, like they hadn't been outside for a couple of years, um, pasty, um, clearly not on, on, on any sort of health regime, physical acti- activity um, regime, possibly suffering from other conditions and ailments that weren't necessarily obvious. They were not healthy specimens of people, I have to say. And they are the people we were supposed to be listening to, representing the health world, the health, you know, the, the, the science, so to speak, and uh, and basically telling us what we need to be doing. <clears throat> and I found that really hard to swallow. I found the whole thing hard to swallow, but particularly listening to being told by people that looked bloody unhealthy, quite frankly, uh, how, to, how, to, how to be healthy. And, it, and, and really this, the message was very simple and very, very brief. It was like, go and get the jab. Um, there was no mention of maybe vitamin C, vitamin D, um, any 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 basic stuff. Go get some, go go and exercise, eat decent food. Um, you know what they should have been mandating if, if they're going to mandate anything is uh, is is healthy food. You know you need you must eat, go and eat healthy healthy food. Show us your your tick that says you've been eating healthy food for a week. Um, banning processed food soft drinks, whatever. I mean, the list could be endless, of course, but <clears throat> but but the good doctor, he um, he made some good points, of, not necessarily about that specifically, but he did say, made the point that, you know, those who are who are bestowed with the responsibility um, to to implement, to to engage, to help people get healthy, um, you would hope that those doctors are actually, you know, <clears throat> setting a really good example for themselves. And he's a really fit rooster. Like he's 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 great. He's he he absolutely walks the talk. And it just occurred to me. It was a really good point. It was on the back of that whole the health ministers looking like you know. And I guess the other thing too, the health ministers. I mean, do any of them have? Are they any of them doctors? Very rarely is a health minister a doctor. And people might argue that's not about health. It's about politics and kind of getting stuff done. I don't know. I don't think. Um, they initially have a decent enough grasp of it. Maybe you don't need to be a doctor in the in the in the in the in the conventional sense of the word. However, the the, the ministers and the health supposed heads of health and that sort of stuff, my God, you've never seen a more unhealthy group of people. The irony of it. Nonetheless, um, Pran had a, he just had some really interesting things to say. And if you, I think you know, go and follow the guy. He's fantastic. Um, he's on all the socials. Um, really giving it to it. He doesn't mince his words at all, and I think it's fantastic. So I just wanted to mention that. Also, I want to mention some events that are coming up, of course. We've got um, – we were in South Australia a couple of weeks ago. That was just so fun, um, hanging out with the Koleskis, um, the Browns down there, a number of other people that we bumped into and met, and it was just awesome. We are up in uh, Claremont in Queensland in the June 20 and 21. I think it's a Monday, Tuesday. Um Pretty sure, yeah. And then on the Saturday, Sunday, on the 25th, 26th, the weekend, we're a bit of wheeler there um, with Cherie. Oh, we're with Shantae up there in uh, at Claremont. And then we're down there with our, our um, some of our favourite hosts, the Braves, Mitch and Nina, uh, on the 29th and 30th of June. Now, I think early birds might have run out by the time this goes out. I am not entirely sure because I think 
I'm just trying to think what the order of service is for the rollout of the episodes. Nonetheless, um, you've been plenty of given plenty of warning, and get yourself a ticket because it's going to roll. We're going to roll in through Queensland. We haven't been up there for a long time up north, um, and it's going to be awesome. And then we're in the scenic rim in Queensland there at Tomarup Dairy, Tomarup Dairy on the 14th, 15th of July, and we cannot wait. Uh, of course, RCS Convergence on the 15th and 16th of. July, that's going to be awesome. I'm just looking at the we're really looking at the program the other day. There's so many wonderful speakers. It is a absolute must. Get your tickets <clears throat> on RCSC 2022. I hope that's right. dot com dot au. That's the website. If you can't, if I bugger that up and you're sending you somewhere strange, go to RCS Australia website. Google them. Get on the events page and get yourself some tickets. Now, quick one, um, John and Kim Koleski. Oh, my God, what a wonderful couple of days we had there at Koleski Farm in the Barossa Valley. Apart from being in the Barossa and it just being an amazing place to be, I, I just love it down there. Uh, it's, it's, it's it's a culmination of the people, the food, the, sort of the dryness. It's not harsh. It's just this wonderful – I mean, it's Mediterranean climate, but there are aspects of it um, that literally look like – you're in the Mediterranean country, and I just <clears throat> just love it. Obviously, different vegetation types and things, but just that kind of feel, the spirit of it's just beautiful. So I sat down with John and Kim, uh, John being fifth gen- uh, sixth generation on that farm and Kim being the sixth. Um, John, just amazing, lovely fellow who um, has just created a wonderful family business there and, and continues the legacy of his father and his previous generations. And Kim with his brothers, Tony and Troy, just making some amazing wine, growing amazing grapes, Amazing wine, using biodynamics, and just it's just some really good sort of lessons and chats about legacy, you know, intergenerational sort of um, that context of you know a working business, a working farm, and just the good yarns, good stories about growing up, and the I think we talked about the burner horse, the burner horse. My God, that's just a classic. You'll have to listen to it next week. Uh, to understand what I'm talking about uh, and enjoy as much as I did the interview with John and Kim Koleski on The Regenerative Journey. Um, okay, we're on. Boys, hang on, let me just check the... Yeah, I can hear, I can hear that, all right. Um, welcome to The Regenerative Journey, John and Kim, and welcome to the western veranda of the main main homestead here. Mm-hmm. A Koleski farm. Um, I might start with you, Kim. Uh, well, we're just talking about the birds and how wonderful they were that these microphones could pick them up so well. We're luckily we haven't got that little bunch of little ones in the tree here because they, <laughs> they were quite noisy. Is that a fox over there? I think I just saw a fox. Yeah, foxes here. We do. Uh, yeah, yeah. He just went into that. See that big pile of timber there. Oh, yep. Just to the, on the bottom side in the shadow. He just went into that thing there. Oh, I didn't see him. I can't see it. The right. bugger. Possible the neighbours uh, sheep are lambing at the moment. Yeah. So well, so cows I, are lambing. So at the moment. Are <laughs> That's right. Well, there's one down here. I think just on the fence, like like a sheep just down there, isn't it? Just on the other side of the fence. Oh. Or is that a post? Oh, no, could no, be that's a stump. Oh, it could be a post. stump. Yeah, bad my bad's my side. Kim, I'll start with you. Um, well, uh, for the, the listeners, we've got John and Kim Koleski. Um, we are at Koleski Farm, and we've been here for a couple of days. Doing uh, we've done one day of our biodynamic um, introduction biodynamics workshop, which has been wonderful. And this this is a biodynamic farm. We'll get into sort of how and who and why, you know, soon. Um, but oh, better I've got to remember to swing this microphone. Oh, Kim, you might remember to do that yeah, too. All right. I've only got I've got three three men and two mi- two microphones. Um, Kim, what's it? What is it like to be here, um, sitting next to your dad, looking at it? I know that over the road is not yours, but this part here yeah. is. You grew up in this house. What does it feel like to be sitting here with Dad? I was, it was wonderful hearing you two chatter away there. I was just getting organised in the room behind me. Okay. And you two chattering yeah. away. I was eavesdropping um, a bit. Oh, look, I'm, I'm extremely proud. And I, I'm, I'm very fortunate to, um, to have this opportunity and have this in front of me. Um, for what Mum and Dad did years ago, they worked so hard. To, to set this up so I could actually come into a, a farm that was productive, um, it was profitable and it was a great place to live and work. And, uh, and then, um, you know, when we did go completely organic biodynamic, uh, obviously a, a healthy environment to work into. So, and, and working beside mum and dad for so long, uh, it's, it's been a pleasure um, and uh, I, I wouldn't change it for the world. 
Yeah. And John, what's it like sitting here with your son, who's doing wonderful things with the farm that you, you know, you you grew up here. We'll get to sort of the generational, wonderful generational thing that's happening. Mm-hmm. What what what's it like sitting next? You're proud of this bloke here. Yes, we are. At the moment, <laughs> I'm very proud. Proud of Kim. Yeah, the the job he's doing, and 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 that is that is carrying on and, and doing what we believed in. You know, of, of doing things naturally as possible, organically, biodynamically. Um, we're we're proud of our whole family that they're all inclined the same way. So it's it's a joy for us, a great joy for us that it's continuing like that. Yes. And you, you your. We'll get to a bit later on, but your I may as well say it up front, your <coughs> your sixth generation, Koleski here. Yes. yes. Troy being sitting up, you know, seven and yes. the and, and the family, yeah, his Troy siblings. Seven, yes. And um and obviously your grandchildren, those that are that are on, on farm, they're they're eighth generation. That's yeah. quite remarkable. Yes, yes it is. It's, it's there's there's a lot of history here on this farm, you know, and, and still being in in, in the family, yeah. We're, we're proud of it, and, and it looks promising with the with the grandchildren that there'll be that everything will keep going. So at this stage, so and that's a great joy for Lorraine and I as parents, as grandparents. Mm. Well, so, <clears throat> yeah, so let's because you're the older of the two, John. Not by much, but um, what well, I'll stick with you. Tell me, um, so you you grew up here. You were you started your your life. Um, in, what was your your father? Was he, in, you know, what was his sort of philosophy on farming? Um, he he didn't have any in, in you know. Well, I suppose when when he would have been young, they would have been pretty well organically farming right back in his early years. Mm. But um, obviously, then superphosphate came in and everything else. Things changed, um, and he was just happy to carry on the way what he had learnt from his father, I suppose, in a way, and, and uh, he didn't have any inclination of, of changing things and, and going down the organic path or anything like that, you know. So um, I suppose it was in the in about in the middle 80s when we sort of just didn't feel right the way things were going, we were using chemicals and things like that, and, and, um, and th- we started playing around with, uh, you know, using some biology and things like that, and... At the same time, at that early stage, um, there was limited information out there to, you know, it was pretty hard, um, pretty hard to get information and what to do. And we were pretty green ourselves and limited knowledge, but we we went to as many biological, organic conferences type of thing what we could get our hands on. Uh, we in South Australia or even interstate, and gradually we built more knowledge we had more knowledge of things and understood things better um i think our turning point came when we we went wherever it was to one organic conference and the emphasis there was very much on having your soils balanced and we um came home we did we soil tested the whole property and then we knew where you know our shortfalls of things, and um, we try to adjust our property as much as possible to have it your calcium magnesium ratios and everything else as much in balance as possible. Um, and and I, I've since that I think that that was a real turning point for us. And then, well, then we became fully certified organic, and then after that, biodynamic. So uh, we feel biodynamics is the pinnac- pinnacle of organic. So. Mm. Yeah, so that's that's what we do. So. <clears throat> we'll get back to we'll get back to the biodynamics because that's obviously a, one of your sort of <clears throat> pillars of, of soil health and, and human health and environmental health. Yes. What explain sort of tell us a bit more about your childhood here? You know that so so just so I'm clear, your the farming practices of your dad and and you as a youngster were more more conventional, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. What was it? What was it like living being a young buck here in um, in the Brossa Valley? You know, you, you were. You were sixth generation then. Did that mean anything to you? To then was it sort of? Did you feel the legacy, or were you, you know, kind of thinking about the previous generations? Was that of importance to you, or were you just like you're a farmer boy just getting on with the job? Yeah, it, it was probably more of a farmer boy getting on with the job <laughs> because I think when you're young, you you don't think much about 
generations and everything like that. Um, I'm certainly, you know, proud to be here and, and, and have the opportunity, but, um, yeah, it's, it's not not the same as what you think about things today as you're getting older, you know, and, and appreciate things more, you know. Uh, um, yeah, I just can't remember what was one of the first questions you asked me. I, I oh, know, just the, um, you know, like what, what was, you know, your life here, you were, you had mixed uh, mixed enterprise, you have, you had, to, you, you, grapes didn't go in until a bit lo- lo- later on, wasn't it? No, no, grapes. no, no. Oh, no, grapes were here in, ni- in, hang on, 1875. That's right, grapes have been here for a long time. They've been here for a long time. Yeah, grapes have been here for a long time. Well, we were, we were basically grape growing, it was very much a mixed farm, grape growing, dairy, uh, pigs, uh, chooks, mm. orchard, orchard ap- yeah, fruit orchard. Or, yeah. So a commercial orchard to area where you were selling there? Commercial yeah. commercial wow. orchard, yeah. Mm. It, it was typical of the mixed farms in the Brosser in those days, and, yeah. you know. But then in time, as as all things, you, you could see that you have to go into enterprises and, and have less enterprises but bigger, bigger enterprises yeah. to... Uh, be be really viable. Um, Do you think yeah. that's been a that's been a bit of a trend over time that 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 you know whether farmers have had to make that decision or forced into it or it's just a sensible decision to you know not be so quite diverse and spread yourself so thin over too many enterprises? You, you think that's a was that kind of a decision you consciously made or that's just the way it ended up going? Well, probably more the way it ended up going, I suppose, in in a, in a way, yeah, because. Um, because I mean, it, originally, like, it was reasonably small quantities of everything. I suppose vineyard was was still the main enterprise, even way back when I left school, mm. um, started working home. The vineyard was still the main enterprise then, but uh, but you know, a few cows and pigs and stuff like that. But but uh, yeah, eventually we just felt we had to specialise mainly mainly in, in vineyard and 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 uh, all the organic cropping now as, as well, of course. Mm. Um, Right. You, you built the dairy and you dairy. Yes, that's right. Yeah, when when Ryan and I got married, we we were still milking cows by hand, which was pretty disgraceful. <laughs> wow, how many cows? Yeah. Like you you were milking them by hand as, in a commercial sense, in, in a commercial sense, and selling St- cream, stress. which was a pretty pitiful price. Yeah. We thought, well, and Ryan having grown up on a, on a dairy farm where they had more cows, so we we built. Built a new dairy and and uh, milk was a machine, and uh, that was a day and night change for us because even even the first we still remember the very first milk check we got was about four times the amount of what when we sold cream the very first month we it was just such a such a game changer and and so uh, focusing on milk not not the cream side of it yeah that's right selling whole milk yes. yeah and um, and you. you Built the entire dairy. Yeah, Ryan and I built the entire dairy from scratch. Yeah, brick by brick and the whole thing. I still remember um, we we started building dairy after we finished the summer harvest, and it was late January, early February. We started on it, and then it was vintage came along. We were hand picking all the grapes at that stage, and um, and we got up, got the walls up in the dairy and some of the timber on the roof, and then. After picking grapes all day, I'd often put on two or three sheets of iron after after knocked off from grape picking, and and uh, just to try and get this dairy finished that we could use it. And uh, it was just on the start of pruning season. Then we had the dairy all finished because concrete floor had to go in the yards. Have to, you know, I made up all the bales in the yard. Everything we we had had no money. We had to had to make everything ourselves. And um, and when we we milked in the dairy for the first time was was pretty exciting, yeah. So quite that, a ch- quite a change. Yeah. And you and how long did you milk in the dairy? Like how long how long did you, were you doing that that uh, we, the dairy? We is? had cows in for I hope it was fifteen years, uh, and then we decided. Well, um, by that time we had also in the middle of seventies we had started a we were selling hay uh, as well, and then we. Um, Things were pretty tight with the grape industry where grapes were hard, difficult to sell. We had a young family and two families living off the property and we decided we'd have to, we'd value add the hay. Instead of selling the hay, we'd value add the hay. So we, we bought ourselves a, a portable, big portable chaff, commercial chaff cutter and it was rather 
um, me- meant to be, I think, because um, we bought this chaff cutter and there was an advert in the stock journal, someone looking wanting to buy chaff. So it was, <laughs> <laughs> it was... It was meant to be. That was meant to be, all right. to be, and, and um, we had an opportunity. We contacted them and, and um, yeah, we they were our first customer and it just... It just grew from there, and um, but this was a big portable machine. Um, it was quite okay to get going, but my dream was still to have a, a permanent setup chaff milling operation. And um, we bought an old chaff cutter from over at Freelink. Um, that mill had been shut for many, many years, and I completely rebuilt the machine. Uh, it was an old wooden frame one, uh, rebuilt it all with steel and and um, built the whole shaft mill setup. It took a, I think it took me about three years to, to build it all. Just in, I didn't have a lot of spare time um, doing the farm work as well, but then we, could, then we had a proper commercial mill setup and we did that for, um, yeah, 42 years. We cut chaff. Wow. And, uh, you only stopped doing it a couple of years ago, didn't you? Only a couple of years ago, yes. Is that yes. right? Kim just felt well. We were spreading ourselves a bit thin, and we, and we, that was true. We we had to put more emphasis on the grape growing and side of it. Because we had, um, we had planted um, a whole lot more vineyard. So probably from the late nineties up until um, I don't know for 15, 15 years there, we probably planted you know close to seventy acres of vineyard. Um, so that's. That's a massive undertaking. So that's that's a lot of time and effort and, and cost. And uh, so, yeah, we were spreading ourselves a bit thin. And then with the chaff mill, we were getting um, a local farmer to grow the hay or as a standing crop, we'd go and cut it and bale it and cart it and everything like that. But he was a chemical farmer. Uh, so we were bringing that hay onto a organic property. We were cutting this hay. And, uh, you know, there's whenever you cut hay, there's, there's dust. Um, and we were just thinking, like, well, why are we doing this when, you know, we can, we've got enough vineyard to keep us occupied and, uh, and plenty of work. So that's why we decided to uh, give it away. And also it was hard to employ people in the chaff mill for only sort of one day a week is what we were doing. Mm. And, um, yeah, so it, it, it made a lot of sense to, to give it away. And I guess I, I think of chaff cutters and chaff mills, and I just think danger. You know, like I, you know, just sort of hands getting caught, and you know, sleeves getting caught, and those sort of things. That, was, that, well, that some, was that something that not that it might have happened, but is that was that also like a bit of an OH and S or W or whatever they call it nowadays? Uh, it's like no, oh, we, we, we don't we don't end up putting someone in a bag. We, in we had it set up uh, safely. Um, yeah. Yeah, it, it was safe. So um, I'm, no. <laughs> I'm not saying it wouldn't have been safe, but it's just that image I always have. You just hear we, old stories of you know you read obituaries and they go, oh, you know, he went through a chaff cutter. Oh like, god! No. <laughs> there, there was a time when um, so we were using round bales, and um, I'm not sure who was feeding the chaff cutter, but uh, occasionally you get sticks or a bit of bark mm. uh, that's been around the outside edge of the paddock, and. Um, this this one time there was the Happy piece dog. of bark or the stick actually moved and it was a brown snake. Oh really? Oh good. Um, Mum was feeding at the time. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then we could not find that brown snake, so we didn't know where it ended up. Hello. Um, it didn't end up going through the chaff cutter, so yeah, we were sort of a bit fearful there for a while <laughs> until you know you, you sort of forget about it then. Classic, um, Kim. What about your your childhood? You were you were seventh generation. Well, you, you are, of course, um, still. Uh, what you know? What was life like for you growing up on the farm with oh, well, with two big? What are these? Do- what are they? They're they're like half. <laughs> I don't know. They're massive and they look really scary, but they're the little silks. Oh, aren't you? Waller and a bull mastiff. Um, <laughs> yeah, so they we- are. They've got to say they are the cutest. Softest little dogs, aren't they? They're like yeah. little poodles. Oh, they are. They're, they're hey? soft as big sock. Uh, but if you came here to rob the house, then I don't think I'd be getting out of the car. No, sure. you wouldn't be. Uh, Look well, out, boys. We, no, we, we always grew up with dogs. A um, lot of lot of German shepherds, uh, yeah. Rottweilers. Um, always big dogs um, on the, on the property. Um, as a kid, but we we had a massive playground. Always riding our bikes around motorbikes. Um, so we had a lot of freedoms there. Uh, so never, never bored. 
I do remember that um, we, there was a bit of stone picking to do on the farm. <laughs> did that scar you, did it? There's an emotional scar. And Dad's that, going, Dad get out there. Dad say, oh, there's a few stones to pick up. Always only a few stones. <laughs> and, you know, a few hours later you're still picking up stones. And uh, as a kid, you know, hours seem like forever. Yeah. Um, as an adult, when you you start working, well, you know, it's no big deal. But when you're a kid, you think, well, this is ridiculous. This is, <laughs> like, it's never going to end. <laughs> um, I, I do remember that. But, um, and then we were, when we were cutting hay on the, on the property with binders, um, sheaved hay, uh, the, there was what's called stooking. So putting all the sheaves together into um, sort of smaller... B- uh, bundle or bundles, yeah, yeah um, to be able to pick up with a with a machine to load. So I did a lot of stooking, and I got paid per stook. So you know, as a kid after school, you know, you'd go pretty hard for for an hour or two, and try and earn as much money as possible. And that was the same with grape picking. Um, you get home from school, you have something to eat, you get grape picking, and you get paid per bucket. Mm. And uh, you know, you you work hard for that hour and a half or so to try and earn a bit of pocket money. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I used to really enjoy it because I always wanted to be a farmer, grape grower. Um, so I enjoyed the work. My sister, uh, anything to do with vineyard, she hated it. Absolutely hated it. Oh, really? It. Yeah. Couldn't stand it. So especially the, the winter work. So Dad would prune at, oh, with my grandpa and us kids would go and do what's called pulling off. So take all the rest of the sticks and, and put it in the midway. And uh, yeah, my sister used to absolutely hate doing that. And of course, winter time you get clipped around the ears occasionally with a rod. <laughs> and uh, you well, you clip around the ears because you're not doing not because you're naughty. No, that was just uh, <laughs> just the way it happens. Oh really? Yeah. So you just you just you just pulling the wood off. And oh, and then it'll go it, smack. It grips, and then something yeah. releases, and it. Uh, oh, hits right. you. Um, So that was. So uh, she wasn't a big fan of that. that she tool. wasn't a big fan of that. But I, I didn't mind doing, it, especially. After my grandpa had uh, done the pruning, he would cut the wood up a whole lot more, and so it was so easy to pull off. Yeah, as right. opposed to dad, he would do less cuts, and it would be a lot harder. Harder for you. So you yeah. you 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 suffered because dad didn't do <laughs> oh, no. much of that. <laughs> but I mean, I pruned exactly the same, fewer yeah. cuts. Yeah, and because uh, it's pulling off is unskilled work. Yeah, that's right. Um, you don't yeah. have to make any decisions. No. As opposed to pruning where, you know, you, you're making decisions, lots of decisions. Yeah, Pretty critical. It has to be skilled work, yeah. It was fascinating. Yesterday you showed me the old cart that, that used to used to be drawn along between the vines. Yeah. And those canes would be thrown in and they would be, it would be a burning, it would be burning along and yes. then people would throw it in there and then it would just, that, that's and the ash right. would drop through. So that was a form of, replacing you know some carbon which is interesting but you yeah. don't do that anymore well, do you no um everything gets slashed off or, or rotated in so it gets chopped up into mm. into little bits um well dad I, I can i never saw you going through picking up the sticks and burning them did you do that john yeah that was that it was it was fascinating. I guess that I mean I don't know if there's any photos of that, but I reckon that would have been fascinating. Yeah, no. What, what was what was just a bit further away? There it is. Yeah, that's it. Perfect. Perfect. Wait, what, wait. So what was dragging that car? Was it a a horse? Yeah, a horse was, a horse front, was dragging a car with a burning, a burning, burning pile of burning a well, vine behind it. Yeah, when I when I left school, um, we were still burning sticks, and we had a, a row either side of the cart, and. and my dad was throwing in one side and I was throwing in the other side into this cart. We just kept all the sticks were put in little heaps down the road and and um, and then the horse would just keep moving along slowly and I, I tell you a story when our, our we only had because horses were going out by this time and we only had two horses left and their favorite burner horse was a Beautiful old quiet horse. Burner horse. That was the name. <laughs> that was the thing. A burner, a burner horse. Got... <laughs> the, the, she, like, I've never old, heard that. Old, old age and this horse. old horse died. So dad had to use the other horse, which was a bit more tarry for burning burning vine sticks. And we were burning vine sticks one day with this other horse and the fire suddenly started to crackle. Oh. And he got scared and he took off in the vineyard with this vine burner behind and went slanty across the vineyard 
and heading straight towards the haystack. Oh, oh no. <laughs> so, <laughs> so what, what, we, no, what, what happened next? We managed to guide him off far enough away, yeah, and he settled down and, and everything was okay, but... It was a bit scary at the moment. So. Well, that's fascinating, isn't it? I never even, th- never even thought that that was a thing or even a burner horse. That's a classic. Yeah. So that was – did you move away from that just because there were alternatives or you changed your philosophy on on the burning or just you thought, oh, this is all too crazy and dangerous or what was what was the change of thought there? Well, by that time, um, people were starting to throw their sticks down the middle of the vine rows mm. and, and this came in to chop yeah. up the sticks. Yeah. And uh, yeah, that that made things somewhat easier and better and safer, but <laughs> and, and safer. But it just saved a lot of work not having to put the, all the sticks into little heaps. Mm. You didn't have to be as fussy as long as they were in the in the row. It was okay. Um, yeah, that that was that was a lot better. So. John, um, what about the the philosophy? You know that you you. Um, you instilled in the business in on the farm. You know what was the because you could have just done commer- you could have just rolled along commercially and more products, you know, more super sort of or different you know types of chemical that made things easier or you know the pressure from general just the just the the community general pressure, not necessarily specifically on you, but just like oh this is how you do it here. You know you use your super and your sewing, you put mm. your MAP, your DAP, and like, what was. What can you remember? Was there a defining moment, or was there was it a sort of a slow burn that you just thought, "I just don't, want to, I don't want to do this anymore." Yeah, Pro- probably more slow than anything. I, I, I think my I didn't have quite as much problem with putting out artificial fertilizers, even though I knew that wasn't ideal either. But the real thing came about um, going out weed spraying and having to put chemicals into that spray tank and, and go I, every. It probably was psychological, but every time I, I got ended up with a severe headache, every time I sort of did that sort of thing, and I started to think, "This is crazy. This not isn't the way we should be farming." Um, that's why I started to think down different lines, and and uh, we gradually started thinking more along that biological path. So, uh, yeah. and the conference you went to was obviously a catalyst for for that. Yes, we were, I don't even remember where we went that time, but yeah, that that was that was the catalyst for for a change of thought. Um, originally, we just we just started with one paddock. We did we thought we'll try one paddock first of all, go down that biological path. We did that for a number of years. Um, weren't really seeing great results, uh, I suppose, through lack of understanding as well, but also. When you work with nature, things change slowly. It's not it's not an instant thing like throwing out a heap of urea and you get an instant result. It's it's with nature, it's entirely different. Um, but anyway, we hung in there, and then eventually we we went down the organic path completely, and all the vineyard side of it first of all, and um, that was working well. Um, and then we went down the organic path on the farming side as well, which was it was a, a fairly big decision to make, but uh, that's what we did. And uh, I think the thing was we went down the organic path on the vineyard side and we were – some of the neighbours sort of knew we were had gone down that path, even though we didn't say very much to anybody. Um, but our, once we went down that organic path, we – our grapes seemed to have improved in quality. We were were starting to get higher results with our grapes at the at the wineries. We only sold to one winery at that stage, um, Penfolds, and we started getting more grapes going into their top end into into Grange. And um, we had we used to get some quite snide remarks from from neighbours at times, but once they started to see the results we were getting with the grapes then they started asking questions now what are you really doing and and um yeah the snide remarks stopped and and everything changed so but we were firm in what we believed what we were doing and uh we we became you know you get a bit thick-skinned after a while and you don't really care what anyone thinks what you're doing you do what you believe is right and for the good of your of your work for good of what you're producing and and for your own health as well we live by the philosophy, but you should be able to eat what you're producing, and and a lot of the food that's produced today. Um, I've got. I'm just remembering an experience. 
I bought a scare gun from a um, a vegetable grower down in Virginia. This this would be thirty years ago, probably now. And we bought the scare gun, and he said, "Oh, I'll give you some vegetables." He said, "I won't take them from out there, but he come home by the house. I'll he cut us a couple of lettuces or whatever it was." He said, "I wouldn't eat what I produce out there," and, and that was a, a, a quite a um, daunting thing for me to think that he was producing this, but he, they would not eat this produce themselves. And um, yeah, so yeah, so there was a so was there a a um, uh, I guess that means it's eight o'clock nearly, eh? All the, yeah, all the boys must, turning up. It must, yeah, must be. Yeah, time, must be. Almost hit each other. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was a ra- it was a race, was a, race a race to get in. Um, what was the so the cat? You know, like the the conference was about soil health and farming and that sort of thing. Yeah. At what point was there? Did you kind of bring in? And you just mentioned a little anecdote there about the spraying and not. You know, that's. Oh, sit down. Um, that you. When did you sort of start thinking about the human health side of that? You know, like because oh, I want to grow good soil and grow yeah. grapes and everything. But when did you go? Oh, but that's actually kind of is more to it than just that. I think the human health side really came home to us when uh, one of the speakers from America, Arden Anderson, was over here and he was talking about the soil and human health and and how he emphasised there that your food should be your medicine. And that was a real uh, turning point for us, I think, when we really connected the soil with human health. Um, yeah, that, that, that was definitely our turning point on that side of it. Looking for more information to assist your regenerative journey? Come join Charlie and his guests around the Kitchen Table, an online community of supporters with exclusive access to the Regenerative Journey interview transcripts, live online Q&A sessions, a chance to engage with other like-minded people and more. Go to www.charliearnett.com.au forward slash the kitchen table. And if you're not totally satisfied with the value of your membership and wish to cancel it within the first two months, we will give you a full 100% refund, no questions asked. Now let's get back to this week's episode. Um, Kim, what... I mean, we've had a few brief chats here in the last couple of days and certainly we were here 12 months ago. What, What, I mean... And you grew up in that environment, you know. You and you grew up in an environment of, um, of of you know, mum and dad were conscious of of that. Obviously, mm. was that something that you even thought about? I mean, that was obviously normal. But did you go, well, "Wow, I'm glad mum and dad are so well, health when, conscious"? When I first started working home, we were still uh, growing crops with chemicals, um, and I, so that was in the when. So that that was eighty nine that I left school. Um, so yeah. then it's going to early 90s we're still uh, I think um, I'm not quite sure when we stopped uh, growing the crops on our own farm for, for cutting into hay um, but I, re- I remember spraying crops uh, mixing up the, the spray and uh, I, I used to hate doing it the, just the smell of the chemicals uh, were absolutely terrible and, and we were growing hay to cut into chaff for horses, and I didn't like doing it. And um, but we couldn't have produce hay with weeds in and cut into chaff. Um, your cl- that, your that clients true. obviously their product was a clean straight had had to be you know. clean. They were very fussy with weeds. Um, yeah. And then uh, I'm not sure when it was, but then we actually started um, uh, growing that hay on a on a farm, sort of probably about four k's away. Yeah. Least land, yeah. least, least land. Yeah. so we weren't actually putting chemicals on our own property um, and uh, we did that for a while and then we said like we, we don't want to do use chemicals at all 
Um, and that's when we got another local farmer to grow the crops for us and, and we still cut them. Um, so that therefore we, we got rid of actually us using any chemicals completely. Um, and I know in the early days when I did leave school that we were still looking at biologicals and uh, using different products, uh, sort of monitoring what sort of results we were getting. And there, there were a lot of... There were, there are quite a few products on the market, uh, you know, with a lot of expectation, um, but they they didn't deliver. They we didn't get the results. Um, the main problem with going organic is uh, trying to get enough nitrogen into your system for your plants to grow, and uh, because you, you're not applying urea and, and you're not you applying know, high end yeah, end yeah. products. And, and everything was very low, low nitrogen. And um, so that took us a long time. And that's why we started doing, um, we always did cover crops in the vineyard. Um, we started doing green manure crops out in the land uh, to try and grow more organic matter. Uh, we put in uh, vetch and, uh, and things like that. So legumes to try and build up some nitrogen in the soil naturally. Um, and you know that that worked pretty well, um, and we just sort of kept on progressing from there. And uh, yeah, I guess we we saw we saw the results mainly come in the vineyard. That was that was mm. the quickest result. Is that because it was more intensive? I mean, you were focusing more on it. You're I, in I it more so, often, yeah, because that was our main our main product that we're growing. Mm. Um, so I guess we put more effort, more energy into that. And, um, yeah, we, we, start, we started seeing the soil improve a heck of a lot. Uh, it's, it's moisture retention. It wasn't as hard as it used to be. Uh, yeah, there was heaps of earthworms. There was, there was life in the soil. So, and it's continued to get better uh, as we progressed along. Uh, further down the bod- uh, biodynamic path as well as, um, you know, biologicals. What, when did you get into, or when and how did you get into biodynamics? Is that, was that, did John John go down that track or you turned up one day and said, hey, Dad, there's this crazy weirdo stuff that we should do? Uh, Where'd that start? <clears throat> well, my uncle Leon, he, uh, he was doing biodynamics. Um, so, you know, heard a little bit from him uh, about it. Um, I can't actually remember when we started actually applying biodynamics, but um, so basically because of what he was doing, that we got interested and and then started applying that ourselves. So you got so you were certified in ninety eight, so obviously some some years before in the nineties yeah. somewhere that happened. Do you think Leon was like sneaking over here with like buckets of prep and like putting it out and not telling you? <laughs> <laughs> and, he, and you well, said, possibly. and you said to him one day, he said, "I think we should start this bite and have it." you already have. <laughs> uh, you wouldn't know. <laughs> no, nah, wouldn't know. No. And then obviously, you know, Gavin, Gavin Dunn, uh, you know, he'd been doing biodynamics, and I suppose Leon learnt from from him. Um, and I don't know when you. Got to know Gavin, Dad. Uh, I, I, I had gone with Leon a, a number of times um, to Gavin's place as well. And Gavin's you know, not far far away. Where yeah, is he? Not very far away. Yeah. Only about about half an hour away, Tali. Yeah. And and uh, we'd been on his property a number of times, and because like, Leon was, we're already using biodynamics, and just in talking to Gavin as well, and I gradually became. More enthused to to go down that way, so mm. yeah, it just seemed a natural progression. Then you know, so. did you did you just look at his paddocks or look or the what was the kind of the thing that, that the turning point there was it you know was it a was it was were you trying to get away from or well, being you know getting away from uh, conventional farming and, and chemical use and so on. Um, was that the main driver away from that, or were you actually drawn towards this new way because you saw what Gavin was doing and Leon, and or was it a bit of both? You know, was it kind of probably a bit of both, really? Um, I think we we had gone a fair way down the path of, of being organic at that stage, 
and we just thought, well, if Biden and Amish would probably put that little cap, the icing on the cake as far as organics go. We just thought, well, that's just another tool uh, to add to your organics and, and uh, that's what we felt, yeah. Mm. It, it's it's not going to do any harm. It can only only be better. That's that's what we went down the biodynamic side of things. Yeah. For those wine buffs who are listening, um, so when you mentioned Penfolds before, that you were some of your grapes are going into Grange, I believe. Yes, we we had um, about I think it was six six separate blocks that were classed as Grange quality, yes. and and they they didn't go into Grange every year. They 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 would. We wouldn't quite make it for whatever reason, but um, we had one block that made Grange much more consistent than the other blocks did. And when we um, finally did, we did once we started going down this biological path, um, we had did soil tests over the whole property, and this particular block that was making Grange more often than the other blocks. The, the soil was um, almost perfectly in balance. Mm. Your calcium, magnesium ratios, your your right amount of potassium and everything else, it was almost near enough to, to perfect. And so then we worked to emulate the same system on the rest of our farm to try and adjust um, our soils to, to get it as near as possible. And that was a real, real turning point for us once we, once we went down to that that stage and we really started to see um see i would say a, a lot of change on the property when when we when we did all that got got the soil balance and then the use of biodynamics as well um yeah our, our soils became much more friable and like Kim mentioned before um heaps of earthworms in the soil and and also winter time you, you go out pruning on, on a first thing in the morning and the sun was fairly low, just coming up, and and you see all these spider webs across your vine rows, and mm. and you know when you see that, you know there's life in your soil. There's 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 everything wants to. Uh, there's just life there, and it's, it's it's such a good feeling to be working in an environment like that. Yes. Uh, yeah, add to that. I'll, I'll just mention the, uh, the the correlation with quality and 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 soil balance. Mm, definitely. So. Uh, obviously, the, the the wine makers and the grower, the Aesons officers, uh, that particular block, they they were picking up that you know there was something uh, there was a quality there that was more more right, um, and and that related to to more consistently getting grain. So um, so it's good to see that it's not just. Um, a magical thing that uh, I, well you get it, get it right now and again and it's just by luck but there's actually some science behind it with uh, with the soil tests with the results there and uh, the balancing. Were you in that particular block? Were you doing anything different to the rest of the block? With this, uh, you know, was it kind no, of no? No, we weren't. Um, so it just must have naturally been. Um, more balanced. I'm not really quite sure why. Um, we we have a massive variation of soils across the property, from almost light drift sand to to um, you know your black bisky um, self mulching soils and everything in between. So yeah, sometimes it can be a bit challenging to um, to, to balance that. Um, but you know, it used to be more of a challenge years ago. Uh, where you'd have soils where they go from suddenly really too wet um, to, to, to super dry and hard and and you miss that opportunity to work the soil or, or do whatever you wanted to do and uh, you know you've lost that mm. so it, it was a balancing act but now uh, it's, it's, it's so much more consistent and easier to manage so you, do you find that you don't have to like your your application of biodynamics say or other 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 inputs is pretty generally generally the same across the whole vineyard now or you just still have to go to some blocks and go you need a bit of extra love every you know a bit more frequently uh yep we we still do have some blocks where we 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 look at how the cover crop is growing and uh we sort of say look you know what that's uh, that's not performing quite as well as some other blocks so we'll put a little bit more compost out to help build that ground up a little bit more to produce more organic matter um grow the beans a little bit better 
um, that that'll help that soil a bit, and um, and that's been and that's been working really well. Tell us about the compost because that's you, that's a, that's a from what I gather a pretty important you know practice. It's, oh, it, it is. Um, it, it's been. It's been a bit of a game changer, I think, because uh, uh, we've been making compost for oh, I can't even remember how long, but it's been a been a fair while, um, and it took us a while to get the blend right and the, and the brew right, um, but I think we've got it down pat now. Um, using like chicken manure, pig manure, some cow manure, lime and gypsum. Um, we use all the waste from the winery, all the stalks, all the pressings. Uh, we used to use. Uh, from the chaff mill, we used to have a, a screen in which um, extracted dust, so we used all the fines, um, any hay rubbish. Um, so all all of the waste, so called waste products. Yeah. Yep, and and <coughs> any cardboard off the property, we we put through that uh, that through the compost, um, and also we put some farm clay into the compost mix as well. Farm, like, oh, so you get clay from somewhere on the farm? On the property, yeah, and right. uh, we put a little bit of that. About 10%. Uh, about 10% through. Really? Yeah. And, and is, is that for the, that's to benefit the sandier soils to try and get it to kind of... No, we, we may give, give it to the expert over there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, not that you're not an expert. <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm not sure what no. <laughs> oh, no, no, should well, I turn it off? It's, it's the, the colloids and the clay. Yeah. I'll just push that back a little bit there, John. No, that's it. Yeah, work colloids, it. colloids and the clay that help to hold your, your nutrients in, 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 your, in your compost. That's why we... Um, th- that came up at one of the conferences we went to years ago, and that was they said that's fairly important to get the clay off your land somewhere off your own land and oh, that's uh, a good call. roughly about 10 percent of your, of our compost mix is is clay and that the colloids hold the help to make the the minerals and and everything you're putting in more stable and and, and binding so it yeah. wouldn't leach as much necessarily yeah, that's exactly right doesn't yeah leach right. As, as easily yes that makes right. perfect sense doesn't it yeah. you make a fair bit of compost there so 10 percent of a big pile is a pretty big pile of, con- of clay a reasonable amount of clay yes, yes. yeah wow yeah. Mm. Um, tell me about so, so yeah so that's and do you, you use by how do you apply biodynamics is it does the is the compost get a hit of biodynamics um, in the making process or before it goes out or how do you do you incorporate biodynamics into the compost? Yeah, so we put the uh, biodynamic compost preps in. Um, we uh, we we tend to mix them up into into water and then we actually spray it onto our uh, onto our heaps. Mm. Um, we we found that is actually the best way to um, distribute distribute them in the in the compost heap, um, and that's what we've been doing for the last uh, goodness knows how long. Because I know you you do uh, used to make the balls and 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 put it into the compost, um, but because of the sheer quantity, size, yeah. we we thought that well by putting in water, um, running it through the flow form, um, and then spraying it onto the heaps. Um, and that seems to be working. Well, well, you're getting the preps in there, the six preps, just a different way and much more effectively well, in terms of just the size, the quantity. And yeah, the yeah, we feel it's much more Efficiencies effective. are doing um, Otherwise, we'd have to buy a, a fair old quantity of, of preps. Mm. And, um, you know, ev- everything in, in farming, you're looking at, at, at costings as well. So you, you keep try and keep things in check. And uh, if something is working, um, you know, we're happy to keep on going down that path. Mm. Um, yeah, you know, he was worrying about. It. He's not going to be able to have much to say. This this old <laughs> rooster. Look at him. He's into it. I love it. No, it's great. No, it's no, awesome. I, I just thought of it. Uh, we we use the compost preps, but we always we always also put in a bit of the the, the, the compost from the year before. Oh yeah, good call. And and that that's like um like a like a yeast you might say mm. uh, adding to, adding to bread. That that's already composted, and that that um, yeah, we, we add that as well, and that 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 works exceptionally well. So that's like, well. A, starter in, that's like a starter, yeah, exactly. So yeah, yeah. Um, well, I just had a thought when you're talking about your block um, that that you know that seemed to be consistently better or getting more into Grange, and that was kind of a you know the, the the perfect soil. Have you ever thought of or ever done like got a sample of that? You know, done a collected some of it. Um, of that particular soil, and then like put that in the compost, or w- water it, put it in the flow form, and with the BD, and kind of incorporated or inoculated the 
the other piles with that perfect soil or so-called perfect no, soil? No, we, we haven't actually done that. We um, we take our vine cuttings from that block yeah. um, because, well, we feel that's a good clone of Shiraz. Mm. Um, so so all our all our cuttings come from there. Um, they, they come from a younger block now that uh, we took cuttings from the older block. Um, just so we get less chance of actually grabbing vines with disease, so we take it from the young lot. Um, but we haven't done that with the soil, no. Mm. No, which, yeah, could be an option, actually. Um, John, <coughs> what, back in back in the, I guess it was the uh, late 80s, early 90s, when you were kind of looking at doing things differently, what was, you, you did touch on, you know, your neighbours or others were kind of, thought you were a bit weird or you didn't use that word but then they were going oh this is interesting and they saw the results what did that mean for you personally were you was that a challenge for you to kind of progress you know pursue that were you worried about what the what people were going to think or say you know was that was that a socially was that a kind of a thing and say oh there's that weirdo down the road john who's doing biodynamics or something i I, for the start it, it did bother me somewhat um, I was a bit taken back by it sometimes, but um, over a couple of years, um, I just felt what we're, we're doing, we felt was right. And we, after that, I, I didn't really care what, what comments anyone would make to me. It didn't, it didn't really worry me at all. Um, and I just felt it was working for us and if it's something's working and we knew we'd do going down that right path, why should we worry what anyone else thinks? So... Uh, yeah, it didn't. It didn't worry us in the end. So. And you, Kim, did yeah. you did you experience? Because um, I guess you were leaving school when this transition was happening. So that was that's an impressionable kind of age. Yeah. No, I I, I believed in what my parents were doing was right. I, I believed in it myself. So yeah, it didn't bother me um, because we we believed in it and we were confident in what we were doing. And I think that's that's been the difference we've always been confident in our path that we've we've set for ourselves and uh you know you're always looking at what everyone else is doing um because you know if you can observe something that is being done that's being done better um you know why wouldn't you do it but um we were we were pretty happy with what we were doing i still remember comments from a neighbor he uh he was he was under vine spraying, you know, multiple times under his rows, and um, he, he would, when you see him, he'd say, "Oh, I've got such and such a weed," and it's like, "Well, we've never heard of that weed," and, <laughs> and then then next time he'd have such and such a weed. It's like, "Oh, okay, you're you're getting all these different weeds. You're you're getting rid of some weeds, but then these other weeds are coming in to replace these weeds, and these are way worse weeds." And mm. and I, I still remember that, and um, and and he was he was a guy that. Uh, Always thought that what he was doing was the best, and um, you know we didn't really take much notice of him, to be quite honest with you, because um, we were we were getting the results as far as quality goes in the wineries. Um, he was not, and um, and I mean that's tracked through now since my brothers have started the winery. All our grapes are going to them. It, it's a hundred percent. Our vineyard, our blocks represent in the in the wine. Um, there's there's no hiding. Um, there's no blending of someone else's grapes or whatever. And um, so you know, it it is what it is, and uh, it stands up. And uh, you know, Troy will be the first one to say if if there is any issues. Um, but uh, you know, he's, he's he's more than happy with what we're producing, and you know what he has to do in the winery. Um, to get it into the bottle, and and how that stands up. So yeah, and tr- and Troy being your brother, one of your brothers, who's sort of the winemaker, and Tony, yep. other brother, who's more the marketing kind of thing. Yep, marketing and sales. And you're growing the grapes, and I'm growing with, the grapes with John so. and Lorraine. Can't forget Lorraine, and yep. Amy's on the team. Yep, yep. So you know we're we're, we're pretty fortunate that everybody chose the path that they did, or was interested in that path. Um, you know, my two brothers, they were never interested in being a grape grower or a farmer. That wasn't their thing. Um, Troy was always interested in 
uh, making home brews and 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 um, you know wine. So he was he was always set for that path. Uh, my brother he started off as a mechanic, um, did various things, um, and uh, and eventually um, you know they, they formed Koleski Wines and uh, and uh, and now they're you know. At, at the start, they, they still had their day jobs, so Troy was still a winemaker at, a, at another winery. Tony had a, had a full-time job, so they were doing the winery on the side. And then it eventually grew big enough that uh, Troy could um, leave his job, and then eventually uh, Tony leave his job and, yeah, form the winery full-time. And, mm. and then, of course, created the cellar door, and uh, the rest is sort of history. Do you think... Um, do you have any... Do you have any paradigms that you think you need to change or you'd like to change or you kind of, you know, is there any, well, it could be practices, it could be behaviours, I don't know. Is there, is there kind of, you, you know, have you reflected and at, at times and gone, oh, geez, I, you know, that's that's been a challenge for me to, 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 to consider? Um, no, I, I, I don't think so. Um yeah, look, I think uh, where we are at the moment, um, I, I think we're we're pretty comfortable and we're pretty happy with uh, the, the systems we have in place. Um, we've we've got we've developed the right machinery to be able to manage weeds in the vineyard. Um, that's been the biggest challenge mm. to manage weeds efficiently under under the vines. Under, under the vines. Um, uh, but we've we've got that down pat now. Um, you know we've got I think the right amount of cropping that we do, the right amount of sheep. We, I, I think we've got the balance pretty right. We're, we're pretty we're pretty right with um, the amount of work that uh, that we've got on our plate, um, the amount that we can do with machinery, the amount we can do by hand. Uh, we get we get some couple of contract pruners in to help us with the vineyard work pruning time. Um, and uh, we have uh, we employ someone part time to help us on the farm. Um, um, but yeah, I think we got the balance right. Mm. Mm. Um, how does the philosophy of the farm kind of um, uh, join up with the or, or influence? Could be vice versa. The, the your health philosophy and domestically, you know, with family and kind of you live you live on farm, so it's kind of. Yeah. Yeah, what tell us about that? Well, um, we, we feel that anything that we produce on the farm is is grown to the best of our ability and 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 hopefully as as healthily as possible. Um, so the the organic oats that we grow for four leaf milling. Um, we believe it's full of minerals and um, vitamins, and and uh, that that's going to people's uh, breakfast cereals, and so hopefully that's uh, that's very beneficial to someone's health. And and obviously the grapes that we produce, they're all biodynamic, um, and there is no nasties, there's no bad stuff in there uh, for people. So we've got a clear conscience that people that are eating and drinking these products um, are, are getting some of the, the, the well, cleanest products that they can, mm. effectively. And my mum grows a lot of vegetables. We, we're growing quite a few vegetables too, making preserves and pickles and, and, and things like that. And my wife is, is baking sourdough. So we are trying to um, produce food ourselves that we know has got no chemicals in, that's nice and healthy for our children, that... You know we're we're doing the best that we can, and you know there's always more to be done. Um, and uh, uh, my wife Amy, she, I think she sees what we're doing. Um, I guess, I mean, she's been in the family for a long time, but from an outsider's point of view, because I guess Dad's always been on the farm all his life. I've been on the farm all my life. Sometimes we don't see what we've got um, uh, I mean it's very special but we don't always see it as that special because it's it's always what we've done 
and uh, and Amy makes us more aware of what we've got, and uh, she's trying to develop the uh, Koleski Farm brand more, and with social media and stuff like that. So, um, which is good to have that because sometimes um, you just need a few other people to say, you know, what you've got is pretty special here, and um, oh, and we're producing, um, you know, fat lambs as well, so biodynamic fat lambs, and we have our own meat and. Um, yeah, that's pretty awesome. So I've been here, Hamish and I have been here for the last couple of days. We've uh, eaten like kings, like with as part of the the the, um, the workshop, but outside of that, um, dinners and so on. And it's just wonderful. I mean, just the sense of you know how you are on a farm and it is possible. You've got wine, which is pretty special in the first place. Um, you've you know you've got protein, you've got lambs and so on. Um, you have you know fruit and vegetables, and to sit down you know with your mum and dad and with you know Amy and all the crew here at the workshop, and to be pretty much eating everything that's come from the farm, mm. and it be absolutely delicious, and knowing you know it's important for us that as we run these workshops that the food that we 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 provide to the attendees is reflective of what we're talking about, mm. and this absolutely is like it's 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 just absolutely wonderful that. Um, we we we're here, and we, we you know this is the sort of food we can offer the the attendees. But just to know that you know there are people like you guys, your family, and your intergenerational you know the legacy there that is um, setting a really high standard for you know the combination of farm philosophy and farming and growing produce and what you do. You know Steiner talks about external cultivation, which is obviously outside in the paddock, and then internal cultivation, which is what happens mm. in the kitchen. You know, mm. it goes to the door, and who's responsible for that? It's no point if you know you creating a wonderful product if it gets burnt or, you know, whatever. You know, it's, it's not prepared with the same sort of reverence, and that happens here one hundred percent. Absolutely, and and also what uh, talking about yesterday in the workshop, um, your intent, and you know, I think our. Our intent has always been to produce something of high quality and, uh, you know, um, chemical free. Uh, that's actually helping people's health and not hindering it with, unfortunately, most of the products that are out there. Um, the way what's called, I guess, modern farming or conventional farming is going. Uh, low, low minerals, low vitamins, um, low food value which, um, yeah, is, is no good for people's health. Your contribution to the community and, you know, whoever's buying your wine, because that's, I guess that's the product that gets furthest, goes furthest to field, is amazing. Yeah. Um, and I thank you for being so inspiring. John, um, I'm just conscious of time and we need to... I've got one little segment after this that's for our Patreon members, so it's like a day... They have to pay for it, basically, is what it is. So, <laughs> hey, ten bucks a month. It's like two. It's like two coffees, um, and they get um, uh, webinars once a month. They get these Q and A's, this um, extra content uh, Q and A's, and weekly videos from me. Actually, I have to do one. Can you mind me? I've got to do one um, when we. Oh no! In the in the smoko break, I just sit there. I will stand there for ten minutes and yabber on about whatever's going on. So I'll bang on about the Kleski Farm. Um, John, you, I, I understand you were awarded the Vigneron of the Year recently, 2015, 16, was it? By yeah, the Barons that, of, the, of Barossa. Yeah, that's right. That that's right. quite a, that's yeah. quite a, a, quite a, quite a thing. Yeah, it was an honour to, to receive that. Yeah, it certainly was. Um, yeah. I don't know what else I can really say. To say to that. <laughs> he must be doing something right then, because that because we last year we Angelica and I we, I did a, did a, a talk at the um, uh, wonderful to be there at the Barossa Wine uh, Grape Growers and Wine Producers um, uh, at their wonderful building there, yeah. um, which in itself is amazing, and the and the the Barons of Barossa that that. Well, no, well, that that area, that room, that long mirrored—it's amazing in there, and the number of um, of Barossanese, is that a word? Baros, are you two Barossanese of the Barossanese people? Like you? <laughs> is that, I've no, you are. Yeah, anyone from Barossa is of a Barossanese. The um, just the the history there of of wine. I mean, it just shows you what what a remarkable area this is, and the and the and the products. That have been grown here wine-wise for for many many years. So to be bestowed that um, 
that award, John, I know you're a very humble man, but you need. I'm going to pump your tyres up. I think that's amazing. Yeah, well, I, it was uh, you know I certainly appreciated getting the reward, but it's um, yeah. Apart from that, I yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, I you must have been pretty I, proud then, <laughs> Kim. Were you? <laughs> oh, definitely. It was a very proud moment for me to to see Dad recognised for all his hard work over the years. Um, so yeah, I I was more than happy for him to get it. it was, Fantastic, because I mean he's uh, you know he, he's he's been working hard and with with mum with the vineyard and um, you know mum's been by his side the whole time and if, if dad didn't have mum working beside him doing all the work that she did we wouldn't be where we are today no. um, not at all because I mean they they started off well they built the dairy started off the chaff mill. Mum was working with Dad in the chaff mill, do, doing that hard work uh, for a long, long time. And, um, you know, if Dad didn't have that support of Mum, I'm not sure where the property would be mm. today. We wouldn't be to the level that we are. No. no. Well, without a doubt. Um, and as they say, behind every great man's a great woman, and this is certainly certainly the case. And, That's right. Um, 100%. Um, and I've no, I've you know that's been very evident, and she's she's very humble as well, and she just gets on and does it. And I just you know you hear hear that like as we've touched on stories of you know her her contribution, massive contribution, and her support for what you guys are doing, and what a what a woman she is. So big hats off to Lorraine and Amy as well, you know, because she she's you know she I guess um, being a, the the next generation and. Um, you know, on social media and and kind of, um, you know, has her very big role to play um, in the business. And it's awesome that we're here. It's really because of her that we're here and organising that and and being enthused about it all. Absolutely. And, I mean, last year she started a uh, a sourdough um, bread business um, and... uh, which went really well, uh, a little bit too well. Um, she almost burned herself out yeah. um, by it. So, um, but uh, look, um, she's going to get back into that uh, this year pretty soon and uh, get all the packaging right and, and everything like that, labelling. Um, and you're using some of your wheat and, too. And uh, yeah, we grew some wheat last year. That's amazing. Um, so she's been playing around with that, milling some of that, and uh, and producing some loaf spread. And uh, yeah, that's that's pretty awesome. That's um, just another another thing that we're growing on the farm that uh, Amy's turning into uh, into a good product mm. and uh, represents you know what we're doing here. Well, I love what you're doing here. We better wrap it up. I've got a quick a quick Q and A to do before we get to the workshop. It starts shortly. Um, thank you, gentlemen. I really appreciate it. This is exciting. It's the first time I've done a father son kind of a, a chat. Oh, yeah. I've done husband wife before. But this has worked really well and it's just fascinating. And as I said, lovely to hear you guys chatting away here and me eavesdropping a little bit. Not too much, <laughs> not on purpose. But just, but then, you know, we're looking out here and the, the, the vines and it's just a wonderful um, legacy that you guys are creating that, um, you know, we talk about. It was interesting that, you know, Kim's the seventh generation and we, you know, my interest in traditional owners and, and, and Indigenous cultures around the world and they always, they seem to be looking seven seven generations in front. So, um, you know, Kim, you might be thinking about the 14th generation uh, <laughs> going forward <laughs> and John the 13th. Um, no pressure, but um, I think that you your family done a remarkable job to, to you know, have the eighth generation on the ground on this ground you know. yeah. thank you gentlemen thank we'll you wrap it up and we'll um, we'll do a quick quick other one in a minute and next week on the regenerative journey I am speaking with Jay Marinas they're at the scenic hotel in um, uh, Norton Summit in the Adelaide Hills of the uh, in South Australia it was just amazing sitting with him in the hotel talking about his life the wonderful things he's doing, the community garden he's creating, the mental health, you know, wellness practice he's putting together. It sounds crazy. It is ambitious and it is wonderful. And I just love sitting there chatting with Jay about his um, his own regenerative journey, the food, the people, the community, and the intention he has for all that. It's just awesome. So you tune in next week uh, to Jay Marinas on the regenerative journey. Speak to you then. See you then. This podcast is produced by Rhys Jones at Jaeger Media. 
If you enjoyed this episode, please feel free to subscribe, share, rate and review. For more episode information, please head over to www.charliearnett.com.au.